one. Hi, I'm John Cronin, I'm Reform UK candidate, and uh, we've got a special show here today. We're in the Academy of Ideas building. Uh, alongside me here is Matt yeah. Stevens. Yeah. Reform UK activist, been out with David Ball and Richard Tice campaigning in the London elections and a uh, number of by-elections too. And we've got our special guest today, uh, former former Brexit MEP and Baroness of Buckley in the House <laughs> of Lords, Claire Fox. Good to be with you, as always. Okay, uh, first of all, I'll ask, uh, what um, inspired you to start up the Academy of Ideas? So I've, this has been going for 20 years now, I can't even believe it, mm. and it came out of really a desire to say that we needed better public debates, better discussions, more forums that people were able to speak freely, say what they wanted. So this is all before cancel culture, mm -hmm. but it was at the time when we felt that there was just one side of every story coming out, too much orthodoxy, and we, we tried to open them up. So we have, we put on events, and those events have panels of four or five speakers, but the idea is not that they're there as the experts to lecture everyone. They sort of stimulate a discussion. Half the time of any discussion is always handed over to the audience. We get lots of contributions from the audience. And we don't even just say questions from the audience. We say, what does the audience think? And let, get, let them have the conversation with the panel. So public conversations, and we think it's good for democracy to have more yeah, and more Sounds very good initiative, yeah, yeah. So more than ever now, it's more important than ever now, isn't it? Really, with everything we've got going on, with the whole sort of, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter thing. If you say the wrong thing, you get cancelled. If you, you don't, you know, if you don't get the vaccine, some people might, you know, judge you whether you get it or not, whether you say about it or not. You know, it's more important now than ever, isn't it, with the current situation? You know, if you're, if you're an anti-lockdown skeptic, you don't, you know, you don't agree with the way the government handles certain things, you get shut down and cancelled. It really is more important than ever now, isn't it? I think so, but it also counts for all. We all have to be conscious of the fact that there are echo chambers on all sides. I mean, I've just, I've just done a, a podcast for somebody else just before you arrived and largely full of lockdown sceptics and, you know, over half of them hated me because it was done live and I could see the comments. Oh. And they hated me because what people want is they want you to agree on everything all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm very pro-vaccine, mm -hmm. but, but, yeah. but I'm very anti-vaccine passport. Couldn't and then agree because, more, yeah. Yeah. because I was saying I'm very pro-vaccine, and people were like, what is she doing? Yeah, it's it's the know, same and, reading through the comments when I'm out with Richard and, you know, it's yeah. the same sort of feedback because, oh, you've had the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. tolerate it. I, I'm going to tolerate your right not to have it. And it's actually, it's about tolerating people's right to have it or people's right not yeah. to have and it. And also to be able to discuss these things freely. That's you know, right. I don't mind if people want to say, well, I'm worried about the side effects. And then you can say, well, I wouldn't worry, but this is what my view on this is. And then they say, yeah, but what about this? And then I say, well, that's called politics. Mm -hmm. That's called democratic discussion where you in the public square, swap ideas and listen to each other and don't immediately start labelling people as anti-vax as anti yeah. or controlled opposition Absolutely. or, you know, snowflakes or anything else. So yeah. we've got to remember that, that, that we've got problems on our side too. But I think it's more important than ever. But also, we, we've, we're not in a glamorous space, are we? Let's be honest, mm. uh, uh, colleagues. <laughs> um, the Academy of Ideas is a small little office in Bermondsey. We always run on a shoestring and we always punch above our weight when we put on events. We try and get as much sponsorship, but we just basically work very hard to make great events out of a tiny little <laughs> office in Bermondsey. <laughs> but the reason I'm saying that is because what we have done is over 20 years put on these big, fancy, fabulous uh, festivals and uh, debates and that's how we do it. We did our lockdown. Yes. We weren't able to meet anyone, right? So we had to make everything Zoom debates and Zoom yeah. discussions. Yeah. So this is our What's first live face-to-face -face event on Saturday. And I really am grateful to you for the opportunity right. to talk about it. And I'm so delighted that you're actually all coming, including our camera woman, who is also coming, um, because I know that you've shown real initiative even throughout the lockdown you've followed local campaigns around Bermondsey John I see you all the time in this yeah. area Matt you're very active not just on social media but you've shown a real interest and I think one of the dangers that we've had over this period is that people were demobilized sent home to sit on the couch I know that some people had to carry on working and you were one of them yeah, John that's right. um but but even then the atmosphere was, well, you go and do your work, but then you can't go to the pub with your mates and you've got to just go home and then you go back to yeah. work again. Yeah. The rest of us weren't even leaving the house. Very socially isolated. Absolutely. It was. So yeah. it's fantastic to have the opportunity to get people together. 
and even for the Academy of Ideas, we didn't furlough anyone, um, which has been a struggle financially, to mm -hmm. say the least. But we kept going online, but it just what, and we got hundreds, thousands of people coming to our events throughout. And I hope we kept a lot of people sane. But in the end, I want to be in the same room as people. Yeah, and of course. The thing is, having had lockdown now, people are enjoying experiences more. And actually, with this event, I think people will be more interested than ever, especially with everything that's gone on. You know, we've had the whole, we had the George Floyd, Floyd killing, we've had all the lockdowns, the have inflamed things and made people really interested and engaged. And now it's the first real event you've had since then. I think people are going to be more interested than ever to actually engage and, and talk yeah. to, to your panellists. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that you say that. We, we're expecting about, you know, 300, over 300 people so far. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, you know, usually when we organise a Battle of Ideas event, there's thousands of people. And when we do the main Battle of Ideas event in um, um, on the 9th and 10th of October, that's what it'll be. But we wanted a taster. Yeah. And so it's just four debates. It's not, we're not overdoing it. Um, but but the other thing you, you, I don't if I can if you don't mind me just talking about the program a bit and I got my, I'm doing me uh, put my glasses on remember what I'm talking about. One of the things we decided though and this was very conscious was we haven't got any debates directly on the lockdown or on COVID mm -hmm. or on vaccine passports yeah. or anything because we just think God we've talked about nothing else for exactly. eighteen months. Especially when I'm watching like GB and GB News even now and I'm watching that every segment oh. seems to be about COVID and it's just. Come on, we want to move exactly, on. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I want to talk about something else. So what we've got is we've our opening panel, actually I am speaking on this, I don't usually speak at our events, but is Beyond Culture Wars, How to Argue Better in an Age of Conformity. And we'll be talking about how you get better debate and why we shouldn't caricature each other and right, you know, some of the things I started off talking. We've got a really great session um, on, uh, it's called From Leveling Up to the Skills Bill. Mm -hmm. How do we achieve inclusive economic growth? Now that's right up Reform UK Street. You yeah, know, yeah. Economic development. Low tax, high in growth. Industrial, yeah. Well, also industrialisation. Yeah, yeah. Is low tax, is that the way? Or yeah. should we be taxing more and investing more? That's a debate. Yeah, yeah, that's a discussion. Yeah. Um, and also, there's all this idea that we're going to now concentrate on the 50% who don't go to university. I think that's good from the government. Um, but what does it really mean? Is it just a virtue signalling thing? And so we've got some great panellists who are going to really uh, dig beneath that. Uh, we then got uh, what does the Sewell uh, report mean uh, for education? The Sewell report is Tony Sewell and the mm. race report. Mm. And that, as you know, came out during lockdown, a response commissioned by the government to the uh, George Floyd uh, uh, horrible, brutal Awful. killing yeah. in America. Yeah. And then the understandable outrage internationally and the demonstrations. But then that turned into Black Lives Matters. That became an orthodoxy. Mm. People were being called racist for just not simply agreeing with certain things. Yeah. Well, no. So I want to fight racism, but I also want to be able to have a discussion about racism and economic inequality and social and cultural e um, inequality. So when I said economic inequality, sometimes a lot of the reason why uh, people from ethnic minorities are doing badly at school and so on is because they're actually from the poorest areas. Yeah. It's yeah. not like as though somebody's gone around going, we're not letting you get further because of your skin colour, mm -hmm. but actually because they haven't had the opportunities, like actually many white working class people, because they aren't in an area where they've been given those chances. I mean, so that's yeah. an interesting thing to untangle. I mean, they read the report and it sort of said that <clears throat> class inequality is more of a defining factor than race now. And it's really important people sort of understand that and understand actually it's not because of the colour of their skin anymore. You know, we're an open country now. That they need to have more opportunities and we give them more opportunities you know it's it's really important for people to actually understand that white working class boys struggle as well i mean yeah, so the, the, yeah. Uh, but that's the kind of thing we'll talk about and john you know uh, it's just quite interesting because people will say oh well you know isn't it marvelous that people who work on the bins work throughout and we've all got to congratulate them and it's like well give them a decent wage rise then do you know what i mean like, fine, well, yeah. they, they, fine, they don't yeah. kind of patronize with all this stuff yeah. right what does it actually mean mm -hmm to say that you recognise people who didn't go to university and have got a different kind of job. So, uh, uh, I mean, we, we weren't actually looked after, as I mentioned in the previous video. I, um, you, you know, a lot of the workers have to have to have different uh, different vaccinations, right. but against TB and all the rest of it. Right. And we weren't offered that at all during the COVID right. crisis. Right. So we were even more vulnerable to yeah, exactly. To Nobody cared, cared about it. you. Don't care. The company didn't offer nothing. The, Obviously, you couldn't see a doctor, you couldn't go to hospital, because yeah. they're all dealing with COVID. So, uh, when we're talking about a sort of skills issue, it also will come back to some of the Brexit stuff, because there is undoubtedly a skills gap. 
Um, there are skill shortages, HG mm. redrivers amongst others. Um, and that is because we haven't got um, as many people coming from uh, uh, EU countries. Yeah. But, you know, on the one hand, um, I'd like to point out that has forced, for example, British employees to think, oh, maybe we better employ some people from here then and not lazily always mm. look to get cheap labour, which exploited those European workers, Absolutely. by the way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, a really important thing is what, what we need to do now we've got Brexit is actually have more apprenticeships. Yeah. Because a lot of the time they're sneered upon, especially from young people my age, it's like, oh, you're doing an apprenticeship. And actually, they're so important. People Why aren't need we to... employing yeah. or, or building up more British people rather than people from other countries? Yeah. But also, a lot first. of people who yeah. are now settled here Yes. In the UK, from European countries, and they, 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 that's great because they exactly. came over during that time. Fair enough. They should also not be just seen as cheap labour. Exactly. So yeah. they, as well, so it's anyone yeah. who lives here, right, and lives here legitimately. And so that skill session is actually very different, not COVID related, but it's about how we're going to kind of build society post, mm. uh, post pandemic in a way, and post Brexit. <laughs> um, and, and, then, and then we kind of, we're also going to have a discussion, um, and, and that's where it fits in, sorry, with the whole race question, because that, the whole point about Tony Stoll's report is to say, yeah, it is true that there are sections of ethnic minorities who appear to be doing very badly, mm. right? It's not just white work classes, no, but no, why definitely. is it this group, but then why is that ethnic minority group doing really well? And so we've got Tony Stoll there, we've got some of the experts who are involved in that race yeah. report to talk about it and have that open conversation and without fearing that you might be called out as being you know oh, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah that's very important and then the final session which obviously fits in with all of it is about free speech um and we're actually going to concentrate on university campuses for that one partly because the government are bringing in a new law that says that you won't be able to cancel people on campus and i'm not quite sure about it how's that gonna, yeah exactly how's that going to work but nonetheless i think because a lot of the free speech rows started at university campuses we can learn from listening to people there about how they're dealing with it, what's going on, and why it's now spread out into the broader society. And so just four sessions, hopefully lots of discussion, no doubt then people will go for a drink and a chat, and as much as it is important will be those chats at lunchtime, meeting new people, um, I know that just as he was leaving, Alistair was saying to you, Matt, I'm going to make sure I've introduced you to people, yeah, a couple of people I want you mm -hmm. to meet, John. Yeah. Um, we're going to make sure, and then we, you know, the, the hundreds of us, we'll all be just chatting. What do you think of that session? What do you think of that person? Is I so in missed. real life. Yeah. 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 Everyone's missed that so much, haven't they? Yeah. Yes, it's, yes so the, this is on this Saturday uh, at uh, the, is it, is it is Christchurch? No, it's uh, Church, Christ, House. Church, Church House. Church House, Westminster. It's right at the heart of Westminster. It's actually where the bishops are kind of based uh, uh -huh. from the House of Lords. And also it's a beautiful old building. Um, during the war, it's where the, the, the commons had to meet because they were worried about being bombed. It's where the laws have met from time to time. Um, it starts and at 10, And it, it starts at... You, registration at uh, 10. There's a 10.45 welcome yeah. address. And then we go straight in at 11 o'clock to the sessions. Goes on till 6 o'clock. And you're welcome. We've kept the prices cheap. Um, and, pounds, isn't it? Yeah, and it's fifteen, and there's a there's a seven fifty concession. Yeah. So um, I actually hope that as many of you will come along, you can both make up with uh, your 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 film hosts that you're usually familiar with, John and Matt. Um, you can make make, but the main thing is you can just come in here, you have your voice heard, and meet loads of other people, and let try and sort out. And uh, we'll put a link in the description to the tickets and how, to the website, and you can read a little bit more about the event if you're interested. Brilliant. Okay, uh, can we talk about a few general things? Of course you can. Okay. We've got a bit of time, let's move on. That's my ad done. that's what yeah. you're trying to say. Uh, look, look, what, uh, what's coming up now? I know that um, this, will affect, uh, this affects you mostly because you are a smoker. <laughs> uh, uh, what do you think this proposed idea of banning smoking altogether? Well, I mean, if they made smoking illegal, it would at least be honest. But what they are saying is that you have a perfectly legal activity, which they're going to make as unpleasant for you to do anywhere in society as possible. And they've already done that. I mean, most smokers have accepted Doesn't you can't smoke areas, inside. It? Doesn't make it yeah, yeah. But where you've got a situation where they're basically turning the public sphere, i.e. just walk along the street or anywhere, and they're basically policing you around that, mm. it's ridiculous. It's completely over the top. Yeah. It's going to drive 
and people into kind of like you know like hiding this way it's like turns it into a black uh, yeah. market activity yeah. there's about eight or nine million smokers out there you know and I how did it police it's sort of totally liberal it's totally ridiculous ridiculous i mean how bro if, i mean can you imagine if there's a labor government in now talking about this can you imagine boris johnson's daily mail column about how liberal and how wrong it is i mean it, it's totally ridiculous if i don't like someone smoking on the street or if i'm sat in close proximity with someone smoking my i, I can move I can say, do you mind not smoking around me? You know, yeah, talk exactly. to someone, get exactly. over it. You know, exactly. Well, just talk to them. Just say, look, would you mind? You not know, I've got that. that. I've got the kids here. I don't yeah. really need to smoke. And I, I can assure you, ninety-nine point nine percent of smokers would say sorry and move on, yeah. or put the cigarette out. That's the way we negotiate in life in general, you know. And I think that, but I mean, it's 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 a it's a sort of silly kind of government, uh, sort of dictated dictated policy. I mean. We want a smoke-free society, and, mm. and I think no. What we want is a free society, not a smoke-free society. Yeah. And if they really care about the health of, you know, it's always posed as, oh, this is we're just doing this for health reasons. First of all, adults do have to be able to take risks. I know after this pandemic, period, it sounds unlikely, but you do have to be able to say, of course, I know that smoking. I mean, I'm not an idiot. My father died of lung cancer from smoking when he was 66, very young. And I'm well aware of the risks the of dangers, smoking, yeah. right, and the dangers. I'm also well aware of the dangers of, um, you know, getting on a plane and getting on a bus or driving or cycling or any number of things that one chooses to do, drinking too much. Or in a free society, you balance the risks, you make decisions about what it is you do. And so I do worry that they are bending the stick towards paternalism, that kind of overprotective nannying that says, we'll save you from yourself. You know I mean, like things have changed so much since when you used to watch all the old films and all that, everyone smokes. Everyone exactly. smokes, everyone's society smokes, it was accepted. Exactly, and I don't want, you know, I'm not trying to encourage, it's a dirty yeah. old, it's yeah. a dirty, nasty little habit of mine, right? But dirty, nasty habits are not illegal. You choice. are relaxed, yeah. yeah. you know, there's That's all sorts, right. I mean, basically, there's all sorts of things that people do that I find offensive yeah. and I don't like. I mean, you know, I I, I, I often make this point, but it's, it's really true, you know, you, you sort of get, as some, I have to do a fair bit of travel and I get on a train, want a bit of a relax and I'm like sitting there and there's like a family of six next to me and they're eating crisps and making a load of noise and slurping drinks and generally getting on my nose and, 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 the obvious thing you can say is, I want to ban all families travelling on trains when I'm trying to have a kip, and I don't want children to ever be allowed to eat crisps yeah. loudly, and I think that those people are vile and horrible and get on. Or you go, get over yourself, Claire. For God's sake, how lovely to see a family day out. Yeah. And that's the that's way right. we, 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 we tolerate each other. We know that, you know, it, oh, it's not exactly what I want to... I really want them to leave me alone. And then, but then you just have to think, oh, stop being so selfish. Yeah, and yeah. Get out, you know, it's yeah, fine. Yeah. And I think that's the same with smokers, you know, you don't like smoking, fine, I'm not, don't smoke. Um, and, and you don't want somebody to smoke in their house, don't visit a smoker's house. And you don't want to yeah. uh, smoke it's in choice. smoke. Yeah, it's choice, right? It's freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and just very quickly, I wanted to talk to you about um, the whole idea, the proposition the government have put forward, or government sources put forward, about vaccine passports on uh, university campuses and actually denying students who haven't had two jabs entry to the university campus. I mean, I... I, I I always find the government denying someone um, education because they, they choose not to have a medical procedure absolutely ridiculous. I just wondered what your thoughts were on yeah, that. Yeah, well, it's it, it's it's this similar thought that I have um, for the mandation of uh, care workers as well to yeah. have, to have um, uh, the vaccine for their jobs. I think it's terrible. It's, it's a very illiberal position. I mean, I think we're going to agree on that. But there's a couple of things on the university thing that's so weird. I mean, here we are in a situation whereby university students have been denied their education for over 18 months. They've largely been taught via Zoom. They've not had any proper, decent face-to-face -face lectures or all the rest. They have to pay a lot of money to mm. go to university, and that's still been going on. And just when they're ready to return to studying and taking themselves seriously as students, and of course, having a bit of fun as well when they go back on campus, they start saying, "No, you can't come back on campus." Like, got to wear face masks right? as well. Yeah, got face masks. Lecturers got to wear visors, which are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to demand a, that you have the vaccine. I would encourage young people to take the vaccine, I would as well, but I, it's not necessary 
for their protection. It's absolutely wrong for a government to basically uh, make uh, education. I mean, it's so ironic. They say we open up the university to anyone, but we're now going to discriminate against anyone unless they do the kind of medical procedure we mm -hmm. want. Now, can you imagine if they said we're going to ban all? Well, I mean, it might, this might yet happen. I better not say it. You know, you can go to university unless you're a smoker. They probably do. Yeah. But you can go to university. No, if you're fat, you can't come in. Yeah. We don't want you. But you can come to university. But if you don't promise that you're going to lose this many stone or go jogging or drink water, drink only for water a week, not yeah. alcohol, yeah. ever, we won't let you out. You know, you say, don't be ridiculous. You can't run a university. Yeah. And that, that's effectively what they're saying. So it's, it's, it's very damaging. And on the care homes, it's a similar thing, but different. I know people who work in care homes who, who, who actually think, well, that the, their fellow care home workers should have the job, right? right. And, and, and I understand that this is the most vulnerable people in society. But I could, you know, all of those arguments should be had out, so I'm not going to say that you have a right or wrong. I disagree that you should have to have a vaccine or any medical procedure in order to get a job. But what really drives me mad is the double standards. The government have been denying um, people who live in care homes access to their families, to their mm. loved ones. They right. really had a miserable time. Nothing to do with COVID. In addition to the tragedy of COVID killing so many people in care homes, which as we know came from government policies in the first instance, mm. we've now got a situation where the rules are so ridiculous that if even a care worker now gets a, a positive test, everyone gets locked down in their rooms. Mm. And this is like imprisoning elderly people. And they said, that they were doing this to protect the elderly, but they've actually, if you've got dementia or you're feeling frail and you're not allowed to see your family, it's more damaging, yeah. Much worse oh, for yeah. their health. Of course, of course. Yeah. course yeah. It's going to yeah. kill yeah. them off yeah. and make their lives miserable. And, and then the denial of letting them see people as they're dying and not seeing families, That's all of these things. Yeah. And then they say, oh, well, we've now decided that the problem here is care workers who haven't had a vaccine. See, that is not the problem. No. And by the way, if they really wanted to encourage care workers to basically have a bit more faith in the government, they might say they they're some of the workers. lowest paid workers in the system. They're on absolutely atrocious working conditions and all the rest of it. So if they really wanted to improve care in care homes from care them. workers, they would encourage... Absolutely. Uh, exactly. I mean, I mean, it's scandalous at the moment that there's about, they reckon there's about 50,000 people that have um, haven't been diagnosed with dementia since, since, the COVID, uh, since COVID happened. It's, uh, and we've already got three hundred, uh, three quarters of a million. Yeah, that, exactly. uh, that are in with dementia. Well, it's... I think there's going to be many, many more. I mean, yeah. and then the thing is, what they did, and I mean, I actually made a point about it in the Lords, by the way. The, you the, mentioned the, John's campaign. Didn't John's you? campaign. Yeah, yeah, yeah I really yeah. like them. But also, they, they've got this ridiculous thing where they were saying, in order to get the diagnosis for dementia, you have to have go through a number of tests. And if you don't get that diagnosis, you don't get the help and support, you know, so you need it. I mean, not only do you probably need to know, but the medical yeah. intervention needs to know what kind of dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's, what particular type, and also the earlier the better. Anyway, they would get people phoning up. Can you imagine if you, you're on early dementia and you kind of a bit muddled and a bit confused yeah. and they say, zoom in. God. I mean, and do the test that, I mean, it's oh, barbaric, right? It's, yeah. it's awful because that's the one thing. If you're a bit worried that you've got it or you're you worried your mum's got it, eye, yeah. you, you know, but the family I mean, I needs to be I mean, looked after my mum for six years. Oh, she had dementia. And uh, what, what, what put me off putting her into a home, for example, was they, were, they didn't, ask, um, didn't ask how we were or how my mother was, what assets she had. That's all they were interested I know, in. I know, it's awful. It was yeah. very off-putting for a lot of people. Absolutely. Know? and But you can imagine if she'd gone... I mean, my mum was in a home um, for the last five years, and it was that was tough. Um, if I'd have not been able to see her or, uh, and we'd have gone through... I mean, awful, I think yeah. I would... I mean, she only just died before COVID started, and isn't it tragic that I now think, thank God she did, because I couldn't have... I couldn't have coped with her. Not right. seeing her. Seen well, also, yeah. her feeling that we'd forgotten her. Yeah. I mean, when you've got dementia and you think people, you've understand. forgotten, you, you don't, don't understand. understand. Exactly. Yeah. The, the idea of trying to explain to somebody with starting dementia, I mean, it's awful. And then lots of people actually developed dementia in care homes during this time because they were just elderly and frail, but they'd been locked up the street so badly that actually their minds started to go. Anyway, the whole thing is awful. So, um, yeah, that, um, so... I'm worried about students and all that, but it's just the general atmosphere around this, which is to weaponize 
vaccines. And I think what's going to happen is it's creating more cynicism about vaccination than, than less. I think it's really not helping at all because people are doubling down. A lot of care workers who were sort of hesitant and you maybe could have persuaded them now they're going, absolutely not. Same with students. Yeah, and it's the same with people who might not have taken the vaccine. They're going, well, I've got even more reason not, not to now because the government is trying to do this and all yeah. their sort of conspiracy theories. And they don't trust them and conspiracy yeah, and theories. It's just, so. And actually, it's just making it far worse than, than yeah. it ought to be. I agree, I agree. Absolutely. Don't forget Claire's event at 31st this, this Saturday. Uh, come along, link to the tickets are in the description. Thanks very much, Claire. It's a real pleasure. And um, yeah. I'm, I'm, we're based in Bermondsey, so it's always good to have the kind of, of local activists around. No problem. But we'll be keeping in touch. And although I'm not involved in Reform UK, um, I have to say I've kept my eye on you two and you're two of the stars. So good. Well, I'm looking Thank to run in the local elections. So well, good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to hear it yeah, after all this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, it's on it's on it, yeah, it's on uh, on this Saturday between ten and ten and six at Church House, uh, Westminster.